Welcome to the Pumpkin Lazy Susan. Um, I, this is such an interesting um, project. The focus of this um, lesson, um, or the focus of this project, is this dry brushing technique that's right here. Um, it uses the background, which is black, to create the shadow, and then we simply highlight to create these um, wonderful pumpkins. What makes this an especially wonderful beginner dry brushing lesson is that you're going to do the same thing over and over and over, but it happens so quick and you can do them in a row in a row. By the time you get back around, you've already practiced and it's super simple. Okay, so um, the Lazy Susan is what I want to talk about right now. What's unique about this, my husband and I were on our way home from a convention and um, I was like, you know, why do we have to have, if I want a Fall Lazy Susan, why am I stuck with a Fall Lazy Susan that I have to pack away in a box until next fall? I wanted something that I could change and have it a Lazy Susan. So what we created was something, a base, with a lock on it. Let me show you how this works. Um, number one, if you're not familiar with Lazy Susans, you, ha you can dismantle the whole thing to paint it. You just do the locator hole until you get around to each screw, and you can unscrew them, and that will take the base off so that you can finish all parts of it. All right, then this piece, a little bit more low-tech, just is on a screw, and you can change these out. We sell these on the website. So you can just screw that on and screw it off. In the middle, now this is the key that keeps everything lined up, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Just a second here. So what happens with the Lazy Susan, this is a panel that is also reversible. So now I can have my grapes for every day, but when fall comes along, I can, ta-da, have my fall um, Lazy Susan. Well then it got even better. This is why we had to have a key is because if you, say, wanted to do more seasons and had many panels, then this keeps them locked together and this makes it so that you can have your panels all stored right on top of your Lazy Susan base. Okay, so you've got reversible, you've got storable, you can do, um, like three panels fits really nicely. Now the question comes, what do you do with this? Um, you can do it in like a black color or a light color, like a cream. Something neutral is what I would recommend, depending on what your palette is in your house. Okay, then to hide the ugly little nugget thing there, then what we've done is we've taken, this is one that I made with um, quick wood and little wood finials. This is my cookbooks, and um, the baseball bat is a bottle of wine, and the upside down milk thing is a glass of wine. And then I needed cheeses and breads for the top, so I used quick wood, they come in two sizes, and little modeling shaping tools, and the black craft mat. The black craft mat does not stick. This is an epoxy product, and epoxy does not stick to this. So um, I can do my hot glue on this because it's a high temperature um, resistant, and um, I can also do my epoxies. I can glue, I can do anything on this mat, and it'll peel off. Okay, so I modeled, and then allowed to dry my little breads, and then that sticks on there, whoops, with my magnet, which has come unglued. You need a drop of glue in there. Okay. And when it's glued in, it's very steady. Okay, and so then what's really neat about that is you can take anything, just put a washer and a screw in it, and then that will stick and hide that. And so this is for the lighthouse one that I have. This one is for the, um, there's a Halloween scene. This one is for the little snowbirds. I've got a candlestick with a snowflake, with a snowman, with a little bird on his hat. Okay, so anything and everything that I want to put on there, you just put a screw in a washer and that will stick to that super strong magnet that comes with the Lazy Susan. Okay, so um, in all of these, we've got something like 19 or 20 um, patterns for the Lazy Susan. There's a lot to, um, to choose from. Clean up my mess here. One of the things, this is a project that I did, um, um, how many years ago, maybe five or six years ago, something like that, and what I was noticing, and I think you can see it in this reflection over here, let's see, yeah, you can see a lot of grooves and ridges, kind of, um, that's not very attractive, and so I'm going to start the very first thing, I've got a couple of coats of um, varnish on this. I want to show you how to get rid of that before we just go into our lesson because I think the final presentation is really important. This is a piece of super film. And you can hear, listen to the difference. Feel, 
hear how loud that is? And let's see, I think I have a smooth one over here. Okay, so. This is almost like skin soft. This over here is so rough and gnarly looking. It's not very attractive. Okay, so what I need is a little bit of water. And you can use a little bit of soap. This is kind of big. I don't like how big this is to hold on to. So I like to cut mine down. A little will last you a long time. So I just make mine in squares. You can share them with your friends that way. Okay, so I'm going to dip this in water. Okay, and I'm going to choose, let's choose a spot. I'll choose down over here. I'm going to just take this rough side down with my water. The water is a lubricant. And I'm going to just sand it gently. Now I want to look, see how I have a little bit of color lifting. Okay, I'm going to start being a little more careful. If you have color lifting, I recommend you stop and then go re-varnish and start again. But I know kind of where I can push the envelope, if you will. So now I'll wipe the residue off. Okay, and I'll dry it. Okay, so just in that tiny amount of rubbing that I did, listen. No sound at all. Here's, and no, I can't make my fingers be quieter. <laughs> this is just me rubbing. So that is the difference. And then what I would do after I did my, um, after I did my whole surface, then I would apply another coat of varnish knowing what I know now. This was, number one, these used to be made out of, and I'll show you another unpleasant aspect. I don't know if you can see it right here. These are made out of um, plywood. I think it's Baltic birch plywood. And these are called footballs. So when they get a knot, they take the knot out and they fill it with this little wooden football. And it has a tendency of showing no matter what you do. And that is not appealing at all. And listen to that. Terrible. I'm so glad I know more about what I know now and I can share it with you. All right, so the new panels that we have are actually made out of just a hard board. It's pressed on both sides so that it's finished. These marks that you see on there, those are burn marks from the laser. What's really fantastic is when we first started this, my husband was the one cutting all of these for us. And um, they were not ever perfectly symmetrical. Now these are all laser cut so that they're going to line up when you put them on your Lazy Susan. And they're going to line up every time. So that's uh, awesome. Like we've come a long way, baby, I think. This has been a, just an incredible piece for us. Um, anyway, so footballs is something where we've progressed onward and knowing how to finish. So the varnish that I would do now is I would roll on my varnish um, or I would mix a couple drops of extender in it and that would allow it to settle um, a little bit more evenly. And then I would make sure to sand in between my coats of varnish. Okay, so let's get on with our lesson um, and see what we can learn about dry brushing. All right, the very first thing that we have to understand about dry brushing is dry brushing is done with a wet brush, not a wet brush like water wet, but with very wet paint and very juicy loaded. Um, and what you have to do is you skim the paintbrush, like pretend like this is my filbert um, brush, but it's not a filbert like, like a paint your leaf in one little stroke filbert. It's a filbert that is cut like an oval and then it's shaved from side to side so that you end up with just very few hairs here and then shorter tapered hairs going down each side. What that allows you to do, and this is a big one, but I'll show it to you. Um, so this is our brush, and you can see the taper going from side to side. Okay, And what that allows you to do is it spreads it out, and let me see if I can get, and see how those hairs start lifting? Okay, that is optimal. I searched and searched for an American-made brush that would um, do this effect. It is also affordable, which is fantastic. So um, when we're dry brushing, we're just going to skim with just little scratches of paint. And so we'll apply shape following little scratches. And the shape following little scratches will layer and layer and layer, just like the hairs on your head. By the time you're finished, you can't see um, where the one scratch ends and the other scratch begins, or like your hairs, if we're talking about hairs. But in order to do skimming, that little scratchy thing, then we have to ha start out with a little bit of tooth, which is, I think, what got me in trouble in the first place, is I had tooth, but then I forgot to knock it back down at the end. So how are we going to get tooth? This is, listen to this. There is no tooth on this whatsoever. 
Um, you can choose to seal these boards or not seal them. I always like to just go ahead and seal as part of like the basic prep, prep because if you don't then you know moisture becomes a problem in your basement or wherever you're storing things um, it can be a problem so I choose to seal just to make sure I know what I'm starting with at the bottom. Alright so to seal I'm going to use multi-purpose sealer unless I have a reason to use something different that's a really good place to start. Stay within your brands this is deco art so I'm going to use deco art paints um, I get so many emails all the time um, from people who say that this turned cloudy or this did this or this did that. Um, and so it's really important to stay within your brands. To get tooth, beginning I'm going to use a foam roller. Okay, now there's a couple things you need to know about foam rollers, which I think is really, really cool. Okay, so when you roll like that, you can already see that I'm putting a pebbly type finish on my piece. Okay. So now watch what happens. Let me roll it out to the edge. And I'm on my nonstick craft mat, so my these um, powerful sealers and things like that are not going to make a difference. With this, when I did my certification board that I did not pass, um, and don't be afraid to try that, by the way, because I learned so much. If I had time, I'd go back and get it and finish and go through the whole process, but it's definitely a good learning experience. Notice that over here, where I didn't start rolling, it's like finer pebble. You can see that's a bigger pebble. But if you keep rolling, it becomes smoother and smoother. Okay, so you can actually control, and this is why I like this technique for varnishing, is because you can control how smooth things become, and it's so fast, like look how big your strokes are, that, and you can use the big four inch one. It's so fast that you're not worried about messing, you know, how you get into your varnish with your brush and you get little pull marks. You don't have to worry about any of that. So. If you are on a, fit, uh, on a surface and you want a base coat and you want some pebble, then you would do just a little rolling. If you want it very, very smooth, like, you know, just baby bottom smooth, then you roll until you hear the roller sing. And it'll sound really funny. I'm not going to do it because it takes a little bit. But boy, the finish is so smooth. So I'll just go ahead and do the rest of the piece. And I want to leave a little bit of tooth. But for those of you who are maybe overachievers and tend to, you know, if a little bit is good, then a lot is better, then you need to know if maybe you're not getting enough pebbly texture for your dry brushing, and that's going to affect your outcome. So if you're over rolling and you're being overzealous with that, then that can be a reason why your dry brushing is struggling because you have to have some texture. Okay, so. And then when we do this, the next, um, the base coat, I'll do the black and I'll also roll it on in the two coats that it'll take. And while I'm doing this, I'll do the back and the front. That way I know that both pieces are ready to go um, for painting. All right, so let's talk about some kind of new and interesting things. I know that this isn't going to get too techy here, but this is my phone. And this is the pumpkin patch, the pumpkin Lazy Susan instructions from 2008. So it's four, four years, five years, getting, not, getting close to five. Um, a good reason to order e-packets is because you can have them in your email um, and you can have everything right there where you are. Now what we have here is I've got a list of Delta paints. Okay, well obviously I'm not painting in Delta paints anymore. Um, I'm using DecoArt paints. Um, Delta had, if I was painting in Delta, um, a third of these would be discontinued, which is why I switched. Um, love the paints, love the colors, just couldn't deal with a third being dis discontinued. So I wanted to show you a new thing that you're going to see on the website this weekend. Um, you can access it. The phone is easiest because I can get it down here into the camera. And um, you can access it from your computer or your iPad or your phones or whatever. So I'm going to switch over to um, my website. Okay, so I'll go to Safari. And on the website, and at the top, I believe it's going to live, and I'll tell you in the email when I announce this um, episode, but um, at the top of the paint categories where I think it's going to live, there is a Delta to DecoArt conversion. And a really cute kind of little story is um, my son Joe is um, our tech guy and he's in training. Um, he wrote a code that you can type the name of Delta in it and it will come out over here with the conversion for DecoArt. And then we sent it to one of, our other, um, one of the other guys on our team to make it prettier. And this is what he came up with. You know, leave it to a guy to come up with plumbing. Okay, I thought that was just kind of a cute story. 
So if you look over here, it says Delta Ceram Coat color name. Okay. So I'm going to type in Laguna. Okay, so what did I get? I got a, sorry, there is no such color in, in this list. Please make sure you've spelled everything correctly um, and use only letters and spaces. Well, quick call to the son, the tech guy, and he says, you know, you have to write out what's on the bottle. So you can't do shortcuts, like I would call it Laguna, but it's actually called Laguna Blue. Okay, um, probably called it Laguna Forever, and it, I'm sure it's called Laguna Blue. So now I'll go here, and I'll do my conversion, and slide over here, and then here we go. So we've got three, of, and we've got the product number for you, the, the paint color number. Three desert turquoise plus one bluegrass green equals Laguna Blue. Okay, now um, what I can't help you with is deco art colors that have been discontinued, but um, I can certainly, at least this gives you a place to go for the packets that you have um, that have Delta colors that, and you're a, a deco art baby. So we created this for you guys. Now when you get the packet for this project, these will already be converted, so you don't have to worry about that. But I think that this is just a really cool thing um, to know about and, um, and use, and even with the plumbing. All right, we're going to use um, the, the listening test again. This is after I did one coat of the um, multi-purpose sealer. That's what I have. And then this side hasn't been sealed yet. Here's the difference. So you can see that we're already building two. I'm going to go in with my black. And incidentally, these rollers are better than the rollers that have the flat nose to them because these don't leave like the square little ridge line. Um, when you um, apply. Okay, so when you roll, notice I didn't start right next to the edge because then you can get some bleed o over. Okay, so I do my middle area first, and remember we're not over rolling, and then once I get it kind of on there, I'll go and smooth it out just a little, and then I go over next to my edge, and that keeps my edges from getting yucky. Okay, and I'll just go and smooth it a little bit. Remember, we don't want to overdo it. We're looking for even texture. See how you can already see the pebbly reflection. And I prefer, I just finished a floor cloth, and I prefer to apply varnish with a roller if I ever can, um, just because it just goes fast. Like, this is a fairly good size. I think this is maybe 16 inches or something like that across. It's a significant size. Okay, I'll get it. I'm going to do two coats and then let it dry. One more thing to talk about the roller. What I do is I keep them in a plastic baggie um, while I'm waiting for the next coat. That way it doesn't ruin. And then when you need to wash it out, all you have to do is squish it under cold water and it will be completely ready for the next time. All right, let's talk about the Chef Lazy Susan for a minute. This is really, truly, pardon me. This is really truly just a series. These were clip arts that were in our chef um, book of words and um, clip art. So I had four little pieces that I used. Um, and so let's talk about how I can adapt to them. I put a border, I did a background, and then I plunked these guys right on there. I'm going to use the large yellow tracing paper on a roll. Pardon all the noise. I'm going to lay my Lazy Susan down on top of this. This is how I'm going to make my pattern. And then we'll take a writing device, if I can find one. Okay, we'll take a pen. And I'll mark my scallops. Oh, close to the edge. Okay. Mark all that on there, and then what I can do is let's just take a piece of, we'll pretend, let's take a piece of scrapbook paper. I can take this and lay it down, and I can sketch or draw whatever, wherever, and I can get a good layout that way, and I can see if that's where I want things. The other thing that I can do is I can evenly divide by folding. Okay. And now I can get my four quadrants if I just want four pieces. Instead of having, say, if I had pumpkins, pardon the noise, 
if I had pumpkins in every one of these, it might get very, very busy. So instead, I've got a pumpkin in each quadrant, and then I've made some filler to connect it. Same thing with the Chef Lazy Susan. I only did four, so I needed to know where my quadrants were, and I needed to kind of know how they were going to sit. So if I was doing any other design and retrofitting it to this, I would put my border on, just kind of estimate, and then I would start playing with the size of the piece and get them sketched kind of on here, and then you can paint them on your Lazy Susan and have your Lazy Susan have any design on it. Um, I've said for a long time that I think a winter scene with snowmen and things like that would be darling on this, and I haven't come up with one yet. But I could see using some famous snowman painters' designs and filling in, or some elegant florals from a different artist. Um, the Lazy Susan piece is just too awesome to be hiding. Who cares whose art it is? It's just awesome piece. All right, now that I've got all this junk on here, I'll show you how to clean this up. Just take a bottle of water. Um, you can also use like goof off wipes or baby wipes and things like that. Um, it's something without oil would be better. Um, goof off wipes have a cleaner in it. But this just, once you wet it, it just scrapes right off. You can see there's sludge on there. I like the scraper. You can wipe it off with a paper towel too, but the scraper just kind of makes it all go into a nice little corner and then I can just wipe off the bits. When you use sealer on it, you'll notice that um, it wants to grip just a teeny bit more but in no way does it at all adhere. But it's nice to have the scraper when you've got a, a heavy duty sealer like um, the multi-purpose sealer on it. Okay, so then I'll just take that, wipe it off and clean off. Mat. And what's really fantastic about this is you can make a mess. You know, we've got that trick where you take the towel and you make sure you've got a clean towel under your project. When you begin your project, you can make sure you have a clean craft mat that wipes off every time and it keeps your surface protected. Normally, I keep, I have three of these um, taped together so that I can do larger projects. And I really like having them just kind of um, in a row, in a row, in a row, and that way. I never mess anything up because I'm definitely a pig when I'm painting. And then you can go and look for any little stray bits that didn't come off and that you didn't see. The one thing you need to remember is these are not cutting mats. Um, I made the mistake of thinking, you know, just not thinking at all actually, and laid my piece on, used my cutting knife, and then cut a hole straight into my mat. Um, it's not a cutting mat. Let me see a place I forgot. There we go. Anyway, get it nice and clean, and then you're ready to begin your project. All right, so we're going to go ahead, and next I'm going to show you a, a kind of a cool trick. You can use the airtight um, peel-off palette. Once again, something that things don't stick to. Notice that the paint, where it's thin, that's a stain, um, but it just peels off. I just haven't finished um, cleaning that off. So what we're going to do is we're going to do um, our candy bar paint. But what I'm going to do is store my paint in here and keep it airtight. Notice it has an actual rubber gasket in there. I'm going to put the lid on. It locks on four corners so that it keeps it nice and, oops, nice and tight. And then if, it gets, if you're in a really dry climate, do make sure you mist your paints before with water before you um, get going. So this is a mix of two black plums to one brandy wine. So I put them out like chocolate chips. Okay, so two chocolate chips to one chocolate chip. Okay, and then I'm gonna use my palette knife and mix a candy bar brown. If you think something's leaning one direction or another, like did that get maybe a little bit too red, which I actually think is pretty spot on, but you could go with a little bit more of one color or the other. Okay. And there you have candy bar brown. So then what we do is we peel that up and we put it in our candy bar brown splot right there. and we just keep the lid on that and then I don't have to mix my paints every time. 
So then I'll mix the paints on the list and then I'll just label them. See what I've done here is I've taken our stretchy tape, um, the half inch or the, the quarter inch would probably be fine, and I've labeled it above so now I know what color it is. Um, and then, let's see, I think then we'll just get our paints mixed and we'll be ready to start um, dry brushing. Okay, so I'm mixing my colors. I want to point out one of the things that's really interesting. Um, we've come up with labels that have the paint color name and the number and then a space for a little bit of paint. When I'm looking in my bins and I'm looking at two colors that are very, very similar, it helps, even though you've got a color dot, I can get in the color family, but it helps so much to have that alphabetized on top of the lid for myself. And then as I label them, I just put a little swatch, as I use them, I just put a swatch of paint. Um, they come with a full set of labels, and um, I wouldn't live without them. They are so fantastic. Okay, as I'm tracing my pattern, I want to make sure, first of all, that I'm dry. Okay, it's cool to the touch, but it's not cold. And I'm going to put my tracing paper, I always cut them smaller because if you press on there, you're going to get little press marks all over, and it's very messy to try to clean up. I'm going to use my Ghost Writer, and it's a triple threat Ghost Writer, meaning, and it's called a Ghost Writer because um, the lines disappear. They erase with varnish or um, an eraser or water or spit, um, and they've got white ceramic lead, and it's triple threat because it has three different heads to it, gray and a roller ball, and that's what I'm going to use it for now, is it's tracing. I love the comfort grip. I am the biggest deft grip when I do um, any kind of handwriting, and so I need something padded when I'm doing all this detail work. I can do very detailed patterns and not even feel um, fatigued with this um, with this roller ball and the padded grip. So I'm just going to put my lines on. Understand that you're going to be erasing your lines later. Um, like these in-between lines are going to be things that you would erase because you're not actually going to fill them up. Dry brushing is just a little bit different than other kinds of painting. So I want you to kind of pay attention to some of the things I talk about, like having tooth is a really important one. Okay, so I'll finish this up and get my patterns traced on and then we'll walk through how to dry brush. Alright, we've got dry brushes in a number of sizes. This is one that I use for base coating and doing all kinds of stuff. You can see I've got lots of paint built up. But notice how fantastic that brush condition still is. You can see I've left it sitting in water. I have, I have abused this brush. These are brushes that just keep on ticking. These are new brushes. One thing that's unique about our site is you can actually buy the larger sizes from 10 and over. You can actually buy them individually and sometimes you really need a bigger brush. Um, you don't have to do as many layers when you're doing the dry brushing. Um, you know, you might even fit a 12 because every one of these streaks has to be feathered in. So it's a little bit better to have something slightly bigger. Um, I painted a giant floor cloth though with a number four dry brush because I didn't have anything else. Um, so you can get the bigger sizes, which is very exciting and um, not available anywhere else. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what you need to do to dry brush. First, we, we need our toothy, pebbly surface. We need a flat folded paper towel. It doesn't matter what brand. Um, I prefer shop towels, but I know that not everybody is a fan. And then I'm going to get a color of paint out. I'm going to just get a brown that you'll be able to see. Actually, I gotta, I'll get a darker brown out too. I'm not going to use the mixes just yet because I just want to do this for um, demonstration purposes. So what you do with dry brushing is you sneak up by values. Let's go a little bit further. Okay, I'll just pretend like these are the colors. Okay, and what do we mean by value? Value describes the, the darkness or lightness of a color. Okay, so this is a value that is going to be very strong. Let me get a value. Hang on. Okay, this is a simple grayscale value finder. One is like, it's the darkest. One is black. That is down in the basement of your house. It's where there is no light and you can't get your way out. Okay, and then as you climb the basement stairs, each of these equals another value. Each step out towards the light, which is 10, is um, 10 is the lightest, that's the basement, that's like daylight, okay? 
So what you want to find with dry brushing is you want to skip values. And if you think about values like a bridge, if you were going over one of those like um, plank board bridges over in the, in the Nile or something, um, if you were missing one slat in your bridge, you could make it over. But if you were missing two or three slats, you would not be able to leap um, and safely leap anyway. So what you want to do is you want to not go more than two. Okay, so one or two is good. All right, so I'm going to look at that, and so that's my value. It looks like it. if I squint, it disappears. Okay, so I think we're probably a value eight or two, sorry. And then we'll go over here, and we're squinting at this to see where it disappears. And I think that might be a, eh, not a value two, value three. Okay, and so that's what we do. We're going to look to walk down our value scale, all right? And so, when we're doing, I'm going to show you how to dress your brush first. That's the most important thing. Um, my brush can be wet but dried out, so if I rinse it, okay, I'm going to pinch all my water out and make sure that I don't have any surprises inside my barrel. All right. So then we're going to load from the tip, from the edge of the puddle of paint. So I'm going to load, and I'm pushing my brush straight down flat. Notice that there's a lot of pressure going on. I'll tip this up so you can see it just a little bit better. So I'm going to pull it out, and notice that this area right here is very flat, meaning that I'm not pulling out a big wad of paint. Okay. So then I'm just going to load and load, and it's kind of a load and load and load thing. And what we're going to do is go dirty brush. So I only really have to get this load right once, and then from there we just add more paint. So I'm really hitting it kind of hard, and notice that we're starting to see, let's get you over here, starting to see kind of a glom of paint there. This side, which is the side we're going to paint from, is flat. There's not a lot of paint there. That's what we want to see. And this is like the biggest thing you'd never do to any kind of brush you wanted to keep nice, but these brushes just take a beating. You can use them for all kinds of other effects too. We call them Patty's favorite dry brush. Alright, so I want to watch for saddlebags. Saddlebags are those ridges of paint on either side. If I get them, I'll tilt my brush sideways just a little bit and blend that in. You'll know when you have them. Okay, now I've got even shine going all the way across and flat on the back. That's perfect. Okay, now I'm going to come over to my flat folded. A lot of us are trained with oil paints where you hold the paper towel in your hand. If you do that and you scrape across the folds, what will happen is you will unload your brush. Instead of keeping your brush loaded, it will unload it. So now I'm going to tickle on the paper towel. What you see here is what you're going to see on your project. So notice I don't see any strong ridges of color. I see even color all the way across. And the reason we do this is to prevent any harsh lines when we start and stop with our dry brush. Okay, now I'm going to come over here. I've got a little goopy thing right there. Just because you need tooth does not mean that you can't sand. Um, just don't sand a lot. Now when you come over here, now this isn't going to show very much, It's gonna. I'm going to do streaks. Okay, now see how you can't see very much? But if I skipped from this black to that honey brown, it would be too big a jump. So I have to put something in between them. All right, so I'm just going to do my streaks side by side. You can't see it. Now, dirty brush, I'm going to go into the next color. Now, what this does, watch this down here. What this does is it makes a whole new color because I've got all that brown glommed into my brush. Okay, now I'm going to flick on my paper towel. Oh, see what I see there? See a strong um, little saddlebag peeking its little head up. Okay, so dirty brush will load. Now sometimes it may be, like maybe that color is getting too dark. Um, maybe I think that my brown is overpowering my um, honey brown. I could wipe my brush out. But mostly what we'll do is we'll go over here and we'll skim our next coat. Okay, see how that's nice and even? I left a space. Okay, it's nice and even color. I can go and I can do honey brown again and it's just like doing another color. Now I might wipe out some of that juicy stuff now of the brown. <clears throat> Flick on my paper towel, watch for 
Watch for any saddlebags. Okay, and I can't go right on top of there again, but I want, to, I want you to see I'm going to go into a really light color. I want you to see what the actual stroke or the um, what the texture of it is. Raw. Okay, see all the streaks? Okay, so it is very scratchy. And if you can do that side by side by side and make it look like a curtain of hairs, then you have the right technique. What I see a lot of people do when they very first start is I see them jab and pull. And it makes it nice at the end, but it doesn't do such a good thing at the beginning. So I'll have to reload my brush because I used up all my paint. And I also see a lot of people going in circles all the time. Okay, if you can't go straight, that's not a good thing. You need to be able to go straight and you need to be able to go in circles. Okay, so both. It's a graduated set down. I'm reaching out and I'm pulling down and lifting up. And so if I'm turning my hand, I would reach out, in, and lift up. Okay, that's really hard to show you. Try it again. So I'd reach out, come through the stroke, and then I'd lift my hand away. Okay, so the reason we lift out, and they're like touch and goes for the military, where the airplane comes down and it, it starts getting real close to the ground, and then it touches its wheels, and then it lifts up and takes off again. That's kind of what you're doing here. Okay, and if you need to do long streaks, you can do that too. But generally speaking, you're not going to have very many applications that require really long streaks. Okay, so that's our overview. I'm going to wash my brush. Um, when your brush starts getting like a little curly toe on it, um, it's time to turn your brush over and start wearing out the other side. So do feel like an equal opportunity brush destroyer when you're doing this. <clears throat> All right, I want to make a distinction between um, dry brushing and dry rubbing. This is something that is so confusing. This is a crescent brush, and this is a super duper firm bristle brush. Um, and you can take this, and you can dip it dry, only dry, into dry paint. That means paint without water. And dry rub it on a dry part of your paper towel, not touching any wet spots. And then you can come over here, and you can rub to create a faded look. Okay. So that is dry rubbing. They rub, 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 rub. And then this is dry brushing. Now I kind of got myself in a little tizzy for a while because I couldn't figure out why this was called dry brushing. If you were so juicy with paint and your brush can be wet and you've got wet paint and a lot of it, why is it dry? Um, and Bobby Takashima helped me out and she's like, because it's an old master's trick that you are making the paint look like dried, scratchy paint was applied. So that is why it's called dry brushing, is to make it look like dried scratches of paint. Okay, and that's really helpful when you're trying to put uh, like strong highlights on things and stuff like that. In this case, we're going to do a more blended look. But we have to do a little bit to our background first. All right, so we're going to do a little fancy schmancy stuff with our roller. I'm going to load a little bit more black. I'm going to roll our whole surface all over again. Now I'm not going to go over the area that I traced because this is like my sample board to show you guys. Alright, so I've got that all wet. Now I'm going to take the toe of my brush and I'm going to roll it into the, whichever color mix this says it is, um, we are into Truly Teal. And it says plus thalo green. Thalo green is a problem, child, because thalo green is um, discontinued. The viridian green delta deco art color is discontinued. So I don't really have a thalo green um, piece to do, but I'm just going to go ahead and use the colors that I have. And then I'm going to slip slap, roller slip slap, every old which way. Bring it all down. And you see how that's just making kind of a cloudy, kind of a muddled blackness? Now I'll go into my purple. Same thing. And just add little bits of some purple. Now notice I'm kind of leaving them on the top. I'm not spending a whole lot of time um, dragging those into the surface. And that is because um, 
if you do too much work, it, the black will suck them in. And you'll see when we get done, we'll actually have to add more. But that's kind of the effect that we want. The direction we're going is to have this little bit of kind of dreaminess going on in the background. Okay, the next thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to put a band around this. This is a compass that has, it's called a half pipe compass, and it is a compass that has a lid on it, which makes it phenomenal for protecting you from the point and the lead from the um, bottom of your brush basin. <clears throat> so what you're going to do is you're going to make your band, you just set your point, and you stand it up, and that will make a perfect band all the way around, even with the scallops. You want to keep it at the same angle. If you let it kind of lean, then your um, your size will change. So make sure you keep your angle straight up and down, and then you can store it. What's neat about this, I taught a class in Portland once, or in Seattle, and I think it was in Portland, and I broke the lead on my compass, and I needed it for the class. This has got leads on board, stored right there. And if you look on the website, we have a cutter that fits into um, the, the compass, into that piece right there. It's actually a sharp blade, so you can actually make circles or cut um, different things. It's kind of a neat little device to have on hand. Um, so then we're going to base coat this with our Truly Teal. And let's see, I think we're Truly, truly Teal plus black two truly teals to one black so not a lot of black black is a color that absorbs so make sure you're you're being gentle with it don't give it too much importance to your truly teal color okay so then we'll just base coat that we've got a band that goes along there too so um, don't worry about hitting it exactly right on okay so Now I'll take the Truly Teal by itself and we'll dry brush across, find our glasses, and we'll dry brush, leaving some streaks. If this doesn't show, then you can mix a slightly lighter color, one of your creams or ivories in it. A lot is going to depend on how much you've got black in there and that kind of thing. So if it needs to be a little bit lighter, just mix a little bit of, let's try this. So always feel like you can own your palette. If the instructions say one thing and your touch is very light and it doesn't doesn't correlate, then don't be afraid of changing things. We'll go palette shopping and maybe I'll just pick up a little bit of this Laguna Blue mix and I'll mix that in with my Truly Teal and now maybe that'll show nicer. So see how you can see that a little bit better. I'm just going to do some crisscrosses using the tip of my brush. I'm not laying it down. Now see how I left a big old blob there? That'll be okay. And we'll go that way all the way around the piece. Okay, now we've got a purple color, the purple smoke. I'm going to use the Easy Stroke Round Brush. And when you do your band around here, what you're going to do is you're just going to reach forward. You're going to do everything in little one inch kind of lines. And that way you'll kind of sneak your way around it. Now, you're going to dirty brush the highlight with the purple dusk. So I'm going to flatten it just like I did on the palette that I showed you. And what you're going to do with this is you're just going to kind of give it streaks where it comes in the middle. Okay, just to give it some brightness. And then we're also going to put in skipping, so not on the pumpkin one. We're going to put some little crosshatchy things. Keep them uniform in size and going in the same angle. Okay, and that just gives us a little bit of a detail and gives us something to crawl along with. Now when I'm looking at the directions, it says liner shade with purple. What I'm just doing is I'm just drawing purple along. It's not quite dry brushing, but it's just floating it by flicking it into the corners with the purple. That's just another um, another little technique that you, um, a name or something that you can put in your repertoire. Okay, I've pulled my paints out of my palette for the sequence, and we're working in what I call sequences, and I'm going to mist um, my paints before I shut them down. 
paint should keep for quite a little while in this um, airtight palette. I think I've done mine a couple of weeks because of when I filmed and kind of left town and then came back to it. Um, my paints were still good. As long as you don't have you know them in a heated room or something like that, then you should be awesome. All right, so we're going to dry brush. We need our flat paper towel. Dry out our blue paintbrush here. Okay, and make sure my ferrule's dry. Make sure everything's nice and dried out. All right, so we're going to load. We're going to start with our candy bar brown mix. And we're going to get that nice, and I've got some more. I've got water and everything in that brush. It was floating to the top. Okay, so load this. Working it in. It's working its way up. I'm going to flick on the paper towel. I'm going to start in the back, and we're going to preserve that um, the stem right there. So we're going to pull towards our center from the outer edge. We want to start at that outer edge, and the reason for that is, is that is um, going to be the solid line. And if you want to either avoid the white lines or um, or not, you want to avoid them altogether or hit them completely. Be careful about doing just a little of each. Okay, so I'm going to drag that in. Notice that that I didn't pull it all the way down to the top of my pumpkin. I left spaces, left some dark right there. That's going to be our deepest darkly shade color. I reload, look on the paper towel, and then I'm going to start at the top, and I'm going to pull streaks, shape following streaks. I can go all the way to my edges, and then I'm just going to fade it out at the bottom. Okay. all the way down both sides and now I want to leave some of that fuzzy area right there see how the scratches go down but maybe I don't quite see how my brush is a little shiny and not very shiny this is making this not be as good as it could be so I'm going to get my palette and take out just a little bit more of that color you've got to have it fully loaded for it to be easy to paint and you want this to be easy all right, so I'm loaded, and see how much juicier that is? That's going to make this come off the brush just nicer. I'm going to tuck that in at the top and bring it down, shape following. So on this side, I'll curve this way. On this side, I'll curve this way, and down the middle, I'll go straight. I'm a little bit gentle with it. I don't want to, you know, like stab and kill the poor little pumpkin. Here we'll come in, and here we'll pull around. I'm using the number 10. I'm reloading as I need to. Flick on the paper towel. Always flick on the paper towel in between. Okay. All right, we're going to go next. I'm going to get my micro eraser out because that's going to go right in between here and it's going to erase my lines. Okay, so that's what I want to do next is get rid of all my lines. Make sure your paint is dry where you're erasing. All right, now I'm going to take my brush. It's dirty with the paint. I'll wipe off the one side. I'll go into the orange color that's next. Oh, let's talk about our pumpkins for a second here. Notice that when we erase the white lines, what we get is we can see some basic pumpkin shapes, um, where like the cracks where the pumpkin undulates and stuff. And we have a little bit of shading going in where our stem is. And then we have this darker edge down here where you would normally shade to indicate that the pumpkin was round. So I'm going to go into the orange color. Fully load it. Notice that's making a totally different color down below. I'm going to wipe it on the paper towel. And now we'll repeat the process. Um, so we're going to go here on the back. Now, what I don't want to do now is cover exactly as much turf as I did before. So now I want to go less. Okay, so I won't bring it all the way down. 
going to go ahead and wipe a little bit more of my brown off. Sometimes it just depends on which color is more dominant. Okay, but see how that's giving that a nice orange hue? Okay, so I'm just not bringing that all the way down, and I'm not bringing it as far side to side either. Flick on my paper towel. I'm just doing gentle little strokes. When your paint doesn't seem to be flowing, it's time to reload. And notice I can do those with just little swipes. Now we're going to just go into Dirty Brush into the next color. Flick on the paper towel. And now one thing this does have to do is it has to be dry, and this is not dry. I've got definite wet spots. Um, if, you're, if you're wet, what happens is wet paint is attracted to wet things. It's like a science. So if this is wet and that's wet, then it's going to stick where it's wet. So we want to be careful about that. So I'll just put my brush down and um, hit the blow dryer. All right, so I, I left the room, went and got a snack. I'm coming back, and now my brush is got to be wet because I had to wash it out, right? Um, what do you do if you're doing dirty brush and you have to wash your brush out? So I'm going to wash it and I'm going to pinch it out. Okay. And then what I'll do is I'll just go back and wipe my brush through the previous colors. Okay, and that was on this color. So now I'll go in and just load that color with the other dirt in my brush. <clears throat> All right, then we'll flick on the paper towel, and now we're going to highlight. Now, what do you do if you have, see how I got that joined just a little bit? We'll see if that um, settles down <clears throat> with the next highlight. Now, a little bit, this seems like it might be just a little bright. I might go back into my orange color because I need to decide that, I'll go back into my orange color and orangeify it a little bit more, staying away from those areas that join. Just a touch right there, a touch right there. Remove my brush. You can always repeat any color that you want. And if you make a mistake, go back one color and then just feather it in What's really funny, um, as I've done conventions over the years, you know, you get people that accuse you of doing oil paints and, you know, oh, that's not acrylic, that's oil. And it's always the dry brush patterns that I get accused of being oil paints and very well blended. And if you look at what a train wreck that is, um, you know, you can see every little scratch. But when you look at the overall colors, the colors end up so vivid and so bright. Um, it's really, it's an amazing technique. And look how fast your pumpkins are established. And we've been doing a lot of background work, but um, they just paint up snappy, snappy quick. All right, next we're going to put on our yellow. We might go back over into the, um, I think it's goldenrod, <clears throat> because we really skipped that step. There we go. Now that's that's behaving just a little better. You see how that is? nicer. Before it was just kind of sitting on top and not being very, not playing well with others. So when I want to do something skinnier, I'm just going to switch to the chisel of my brush because I can. This brush is very versatile. <clears throat> okay, now we'll go into the yellow. And you want to make sure, blend that quite a bit, because that's a big leap from that color to that color. Click on the paper towel. And now this one you're going to get, um, you want to be careful not to bring highlights everywhere. So notice how we're going to keep that up the center and up higher, wherever our center of interest is. bit more. See how it gets 
skinnier and skinnier. Now I'm going to wipe out my brush and I'm going to repeat that yellow color. And that color is going to be much lighter. Okay, we'll go flick on my paper towel. And I'm really using very soft pressure. I'm not going to do anything to the backs. Alright, and at this point, the dry brushing part is done. Now I'm going to flip this upside down to me so that I can pull, whoops, so I can pull up towards me. I'm going to load Naflow Crimson for dry brushing in my Patty Spear dry brush. And then we're going to pull this red color up in the shadow area. And it just gives it such a rich look. Notice I don't want to go up into the oranges of the pumpkin. Load a little bit more. Flick. Okay, I think that adds a nice... I can go back and strengthen it if I feel like it needs it. Okay, pretty. It just gives it that kind of warm blush, if you will. Okay, we can go and we can get the final highlights dry brushed. Make sure that you get all the red out of your um, brush, or highlighted, or dry brushed with light ivory. Flick on the paper towel. And this is what always scares people. You want to do this just kind of strong, and not everywhere. Okay. If you get it kind of strong like that, it indicates shine. That means that the surface is hard and um, slick and a little bit shiny. How easy was that? I think stinking, stinking, stinking easy. Okay, we're going to float just a little bit of purple at the bottom of... And I'm going to grab my purple out. actually kind of nice to have all the paints out already and I don't have to look for bottles and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's been kind of, I'm thinking maybe I'll use this for every project and just put my paints out. Alright, so I'm going to float and so I'm just going to side load. I'm actually going to side load with the, um, with the dry brush. So I'm just on one side. <clears throat> over here. Just glaze that down there at the bottom. It just adds another layer. And don't forget you would be on top of um, your slip slapped blue area. Look at how much that black ate that color. Like you almost can't see it. But so we have a trick up our sleeve for that. What we'll do with that is we'll dry brush on top of that. All right, now we'll go to our stems. We're going to use a round brush. I'm going to use the easy um, stroke round. We're going to do candy bar. And the way you load a round brush for dry brushing, so you just load it nice and juicy. It's got juice at the top and flat over there. The um, an ideal round brush will flatten to a flat and then you should be able to load it however you want to. In this case I've made it a microscopic little, um, little dry brush. So where we're going to have solid paint, I'll just kind of make it be fairly solid. Same thing here. And then we'll just dry brush into the lines to reload a little bit more because this is a, you know, a thinner application. Use my micro eraser. The micro eraser is one of those um, that I use all the time when I'm painting lace because you can 
erase on your ornaments and it doesn't hurt anything. It just gets into such nice little detailed areas. Okay, then we're going to go into dark goldenrod. Just give a little highlight. If you wanted to, you could gnarl things around. You could come around and give it like a little twisted stem kind of thing. If you wanted to make a twisted stem, go into a little bit of straw for your final highlights. So you can actually see what you're doing. <clears throat> okay, at the top of our instructions under prep, we have um, that we want to base coat these oak leaves with mocha plus the light ivory. And so the key is, is to get a mix that is a brownie color without being too white. Um, so, you know, isn't it fun to mix paints? Don't you feel kind of artistic? Sometimes it's a little frustrating, but it's also an excellent education. So I'll take my round. I'll add just a little bit of water. I'm not really looking for a solid base coat. And that's, I got it a little bit strong. I'm going to go into a... Okay, and we're just going to go ahead and kind of outline it. And fill it in. And repeat with the others. Alright, we're going to do some of the... Which ones are these leaves? These ones are oak leaves, these are maple leaves. Um, we're going to switch to a smaller dry brush. And a flick on the paper towel and what we're going to do is we're going to go from the inside out and just bring some of this brown color to the edges of the leaves leaving a little bit of space if they're tucked behind pumpkins okay that's your first color and highlight with Georgia clay. So I'll just mix that on my brush. On the inside to the edges. So if we don't draw that this far out, then the goldenrod color. Shine it out fresh out of. Wow. We're going to loosely line, get out the spot. If you have enough money, and they're not super expensive, get a set of these Easy Stroke brushes. They are the absolute best round brush I've ever used in my entire life. Um, just an amazing brush. Um, we're going to loosely line, so I'm using, this is the number one, and, um, and it has just got a super duper fine point on it. We're going to loosely line with mocha, so I'm going to add a little water. They'll dry brush, they'll base coat for you, and they'll do all this stuff. Okay, so then what we're going to do, just line on the eye. I did a little too much water. And so we just want to kind of bring that out. Just to keep that line so you know where the leaf is. Okay. And then we will do a little bit of straw. And that'll be our final little highlight. And then we'll chocolate cherry our veins. So we'll mix our chocolate cherry, and it says with our candy bar. And you'll just give it some vein lines. Okay, just nice and subtle. Nothing screaming memes. Okay, now we'll talk about these um, oak leaves. So we're going to do the Georgia clay. For 
when the tip's in. Okay, so now we're going to bring this color, the tip's in, bring it on down. And then we'll go dark goldenrod, flick, and then a little bit of straw. So you see a kind of a trend going here. We just move our way down the sequence of colors. Okay. And then, oops, I got a little bit streaky right there. We'll do our veins with the chocolate cherry. And on these sideways ones, they'll just come in to the, that far. Okay, super simple. All right, we're going to do our wheat. Get you on there. We're going to do our wheat with mocha. We'll do a little bit of thinning with our mocha, with our water. Okay, and we'll just draw out. Hard to keep you on camera and being able to see my brush. Okay, then we're going to do a little bit of pulling out wheat heads. So, I'll do one layer with this. So notice how I'm pulling, I'm plopping my brush down and then I'm flicking off to get that kind of sharp. Okay, it's a little flick of the wrist. And you gotta make sure you get a little bit of thin with water. You don't want all of the wheat heads to end at the same place and so make sure they're staggered. Oops. So see, as soon as I can, as soon as I stop getting that really nice little edge, I know I need a little bit more water in my brush. Now I'm going to go into straw, a little bit of water, and we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to highlight these. You can go right next to them. You can make them be layered, <clears throat> whichever way you want to go. I've decided that I have painted the absolute ugliest leaf in the entire universe right there. Maybe I need to go back and revisit that one. That's not right. Okay, so you would just repeat on all of those. One thing I want to spend some time with is um, the spattering thing. Um, let me get my brush out. This is a white wonder brush, okay, and it is a half inch and it is a rake. And so it's got like striated um, cuts out of the hairs. I'm going to get some water in my brush and I'm going to come over here. I'm going to choose a light color. We'll go into that mix that we did. I want to get some water in my brush, okay, and I want to just mix that. I want to open up my brush. Okay, that's not going to hurt the brush. Now, I have a lot of stuff in this brush, so I'm going to use a heavy-handed brush or palette knife. And watch what happens is I'll get some really heavy stuff. So I always knock off all of my um, excess when I start. But watch what we can do with this. This is just like almost like a, a technique. I don't think anybody uses this technique yet, but I suspect it may catch on. Okay. So I want to make my spatters happen right there. Okay, normally you would think if I do if I do this, I've got snow and it goes everywhere. Okay, but if I come here and I take my heavy brush and I anchor it, okay, and I go the direction that I want my spatters to go. So I'm gonna hit it in the direction I want them to fly. I guess I should get you on the camera, right? Alright, so then I'm gonna 
If I do it high, I'll get wider trajectory. If I do it down low, really close to the surface, okay, then I'll get a tight trajectory. Okay, so here's what I want to do is I want to back this right in front of that so that the spatters will kind of bounce off. Okay, so now I can get them in that trajectory. They're going out. They're following the line I want them to. Okay. And that just gives me such nice, tight control over where my spatters land. All right, when we're talking about these leaves, let's talk about this. For some reason, I ended up in the wrong sequence of colors. So I'm going to go in my, with my dark out here at the tip, pulling in. So it happens to all of us. I think I have a little bit of water in my brush. It's the fight of the maple of the oak leaf. There we go. So, so you've just got to control your um, your mediums there. And mediums meaning um, how much water you have, how much paint you have. Pulling that on in. You can decide how brown you want things to get. Okay, and then you can take your orange colors and you can muddy that up the middle if you wanted to. Much nicer leaf. Not sure, I'm not sure quite what happened over there. We just will ignore that and say base coat over. When you pull up your stems. Okay, our final thing that we're going to talk about is the words, and I'm going to give you a sample of that, and then I think we've covered all of the overview for this project. Um, it's a very interesting project. Remember that our focus is on getting this dry brushing down. We're going to take our bless, and we're going to base it with our brush. So I'll flatten my brush in its paint. And we'll just nicely base coat. slightly thinned with a little teeny bit of water, otherwise you'll be base coating for a hundred years. Okay, we'll base all the letters. Notice I'm not really worried about filling, filling them in. All right, we're going to highlight with Mocha Plus Straw. Put that in my brush dirty straight down the center area and then in the center of the letters. Flatten my brush. Try to make it go all the way through the middle so if you have a piece that sticks out, um, you know, this little tip over here, you can do that as well. They curve a little bit, so you'll watch that. Then you go into the ivory. Where's the ivory in? Straw plus ivory. And then that's going to be your highlight. That you will do less of an area. We'll add drop shadow with black, which is not going to show on my example. Um, so I'll do drop shadow in a color. Let's do drop shadow in white so you can see what I'm talking about. That's just going to be a color that you put all on one side of the letters. That's drop shadow. Okay.